with me today, uh, Jeff Blass. He is our uh, district governor-elect. Correct. I've got some new members that I need to get into the Rotary over the Raleigh. Any other guests? That's it. Any visiting Rotarians? Okay, not a lot to work with today. <laughs> a lot to work with. Well, you know, we're getting in the um, in the spirit of the holiday. Usually, that means shopping, right? And so, uh, did you hear about the Amish family? Pat Feelings back there, worried I'm going to tell an inappropriate joke. I mean, I, it's gotten to the point now. It's gotten to the point now. I don't even know what an inappropriate joke is anymore. But this one should not. Be. Uh, it's an Amish family, and they've got a 14-year-old boy, and the 14-year-old boy is on the mom. Can we go shopping? Can we go to the mall? Can we go to the mall? And the Amish mom said, no, that's not what we do. You know, we don't do that. You know? But finally, they break down and go to the mall. So they go to the mall, and they're in the big crowd, and they're just looking at all the wondrous things, all the decorations, the moving. Stairways, you know, the escalator, everything is really exciting. And the mom's getting excited too now, so she says she wants to go do a little shopping. So dad and the son said, well, we'll go stand here in the middle. And uh, she goes shopping, and as we're standing there, dad notices this, this, this silver box thing that's here. It looks like silver doors. And at the top of it, it had some numbers. And as they were standing there, a old lady in a walker comes to those doors. The doors open up. The old lady in the walker 
walks in the room, in this room, the door is closed, and the number is one, two, three, four, five, pause, five, four, three, two, one, and the door is open out, and out walks a 23-year-old beautiful woman. And the Amish dad turns to his son and says, go get your mother. <laughs> So if you look hard enough, you can always find something that's wrong. Right? So. All right. Do um, we have any announcements or anything? Today? I got a couple out there. Okay. Uh, well, anybody watch the football movies? Yeah. <laughs> Big weekend coming up tomorrow. Alabama and Georgia. Down in, down in uh, Georgia. I, I got a chance to go. I'm going to get my son down there. going to be exciting. Did anybody go to the NC State Carolina game? A little brutal, huh? Yeah, pretty bad. Pretty bad. Do we have any NC State fans here? Go ahead. This is your year to admit it. If you're going to admit it. But you know, I find myself in a little bit of a difficult spot. As you know, I got married in April, and now I live in Rome, and I'm right in the middle of, you know, all the state folks and. I like Carolina folks too, but interestingly, the Freddie Kiger of NC State lives right across the street from me. Uh, Francis Cohn, he's like Freddie Kiger. And um, so, you know, he's my neighbor, NC State. And um, you know, I'm trying to fit in a little bit. You know, I've got my big UNC flag flying on a flag, <laughs> you know, trying to fit in. But um, after the game, tensions were, were pretty high. And Robert Sprancy had gone to the game. Uh, and so the next day, Robert was going to McDonald's. And he was in line, and he looks in his rearview mirror, and there's an NC State fan behind him, a car behind him with an NC State hat on. And she's honking the horn at Robert, who's saying, you know, I'm in the line. And this lady's clearly stretched out. I mean, she's got her, she's got her hands going. She's Doing this, and and Robert Francis, angry. I mean, he just got beat in football. And you can feel the anger welling up in him. And uh, he gets to the window. And he says, "You know something? It's a holiday. I'm gonna try to do something different. I'm gonna be a bigger person." And, he, and so Robert Francis says to the lady at the window, "I tell you what, I'm gonna pay for this lady's food in my door." When she comes up, whatever she gets off on the table. So, Robert pulls up, the state person's all upset, all upset, get to the window, and she finds this out, and now she's looking out the window, going, oh, thank you. Robert, so happy, he's looking back, and he gets up to the pickup window, and when he gets there, they hand him his food, and then he says, is that the food from the lady behind me? He says, yes. He says, give it to me. Took it and drove off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's all I've got for you. Luckily for you, I had to cut it short because Dick Bedour is going to talk to us today about the Rotary Foundation. He is. All right. Thank you, Rob. I'll tell you what, since our, uh, uh, we had a little bathroom with no mail, we got a little confused. So I'm going to pass the fine basket out now. If you're not wearing your rotary pin, put a buck in it because you should be wearing it. All right, a couple quick things. We only have one more meeting this month. That's next Friday. We'll be doing our traditional holiday sing along. There will be entertainment. There will be singing. Come for a holiday festivity and fun. You have it, for you new members that haven't done this before, it's a hoot. Uh, there's rumors that Alan Young will actually do a solo yet to be performed. Uh, <laughs> our holiday party is at the Carolina Club on December 14th, 6 o'clock, and it's a Thursday night. Uh, I have given them a tentative count on that. I was hoping we had passed out sign-up sheet and sent out multiple emails. If you do want to come and have not signed up, I need to know by this afternoon in order to have enough food prepared for the event. Uh, Couple things, Bob. You've got a quick announcement about a wonderful thing he does for a club every year. But very briefly, I'm doing the train over the house again. If you all want to come, grandchildren, friends, anybody wants to come. Uh, Jeff was kind enough to send out an email blast with my address, but it's this Sunday, one to four. 
And then the 26, 1 to 4. I hope for those of you who have grandkids coming for Christmas, that's why the 26. And then this Sunday, uh, it's Luminary Night in the Oaks. It will all be lit up when you leave and you come in the back. 1 to 4 this Sunday. One to four on the 26th, second place. And if you haven't done this, it, it's not just a train sale. I mean, it's, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I've got one person I want to single out here today. Is Ed Loudermilk, where are you? Ed, we owe you a heck of a big thanks. Ed. And a new partner for us, and he's done this by getting knee replacement surgery. So. Anything's possible, y'all. Thank you again, Ed, for everything you've done. Well, I want to thank everybody who called the volunteer. And we didn't get back to the jobs in the past. Well, it happened. And we didn't have to do it. You and I spent all those 11, 7, 8 at the Walmart thing. It was fun. Anyway, the hate farm, the bikes were there. Um, and it's miraculous because even in the past, we had to get the guys to take the bikes. Again, thank you, Ed. Thanks again, Ed. Listen, I, I mean, I'm up here because we on the foundation want you to know everything is possible to know about the foundation. In fact, we put it in our bylaws some time yes. ago that uh, two things would happen on an annual basis. The chair of the board of directors would make a report to the membership and that our treasurer, Christy, would uh, include our financial support uh, in the proposal, so you can look for that. I'm going to talk with you today quickly about four different things, about our purpose, our function, about our current status, uh, and then I want to I want to thank some uh, people for what they've done, and then I want to ask you to join in. So, we are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. We, to have that status, we have to operate separate from this club because uh, donations to this club are not tax deductible. In fact, when the foundation was started years ago by David Kimball, that was really the sole purpose. It later became added on to establish an endowment which, which uh, Phil Rominger, our founder of the club, uh, set us a challenge gift of $50,000. Uh, we exist for only one purpose and that's to serve the charitable and service activities of this club. We frequently get asked to join in other kinds of activities, but we've asked you for your resources to help us do what we do. There is, there is none of your dues that comes to the foundation. When you pay your quarterly dues, you make a charitable gift. Part of that goes to Rotary International, and part of that goes to the service projects right into the budget. But if you want to supplement, uh, like the bike night or, or the, uh, the teacher supply store, you can give those resources to us and we'll pass them on through to the club and you get your tax de uh, deduction. The other kind of gift you can make is to our endowment. Now, my vision, my hope is one day that your quarterly dues will come to the foundation uh, because I hope one day we'll be in a position where we will be able to support directly all the charitable activities of the club. So let me give you a status report. Right now we have 1.150,000, 1, $1,150,000 in the endowment. Let me say that. And it, it came from you. It came from people like you. We will turn over to the club this year $46,300 to be used for those activities. The foundation has no part in the governance of this club. 
The foundation does not decide how that $46,000 is spent. The president and the board of directors of the club decide how they're going to divvy up that money. A Phil Rominger fellow is one who has committed $5,000 to the foundation or multiples of $5,000. We have 76 Phil Rominger fellows associated with this club. That is an amazing number. A few years ago, we, we didn't start a new program, but we emphasized the new program. And, and it was Rob Maitland who said, we really ought to get heavy in the, in the legacy business, in the estate planning business. So we had a campaign that went from about this time of the year to, uh, to Valentine's Day. And so the results of that were that we had 55 current members sign up for the legacy program. 35 of those designated that they wanted at least $10,000 of their estate to come to the foundation. 17 of those are a part of a, I'd say, living legacy program where they went ahead and paid the $10,000. The $10,000 enables you to have two Rominger fellows, and it enables you, one other thing, we weren't really doing anything for the legacy people. In other words, we, we give a clock for the uh, for the Rominger Awards, and it troubles me for some time that we weren't getting anything for the legacy. So I asked Bill Boland, and you may not know this, Bill's not here, I don't see him. He's a craftsman. He makes these, he turns wood. He makes these ballpoint pens. And so now we're gonna give a ballpoint pen to any living legacy person who, who has met that challenge. And, uh, and Matt, Arnold, come up and get yours. Linda, glad you're here. We had a, we had a reception a few weeks ago for those who are, uh, have, have been very generous and, uh, and I got screwed up and didn't recognize Matt, and which I'm deeply sorry for. I get, but I, I get two cracks. Which, which you gave me, <laughs> you gave me permission. No, you gave me approval anyway. Thank you. Thank you. I got another note. Yeah. <laughs> and Clay Harrell, he's Thank here. And then I say Clay. Yeah. yeah, Clay, you get one. Yeah. He's got one. Now. Omar wanted me to do it, uh, make this kind of comment this time of the year because he said it was a holiday season and maybe it would generate some enthusiasm, and it did. Uh, I don't have a goal for this today, but if anyone is so inclined and wants to meet with me, I'll be glad to meet you. Some people say they've never been asked. I'm asking. <laughs> Everybody here, I'll be glad to sit down with you. My procedure is this, I'll, I'll meet with you as many times as you like, but I only ask once. And then after that, it's up to you to, to, to make the commitment that this is something you want to do. We don't, we're not in the badgering business, we're in the charity and service business. Thank you, President Mark. Yes. This is just a serendipity. One reason I'm dressed like this, I had court today, and, and while I was at court, one thing I did today was um, file some papers on Brian Stabler's estate. And uh, as many of you know, Brian made a significant gift to Rhoda of $100,000 to his estate. And uh, actually today, ironically, we are distributing money to his beneficiaries from his estate account. So I just thought that's kind of neat. I was thinking about Brian today, so that's kind of important. So. <laughs> And I, I, I meant to mention that, but we also have two other names he gave. Uh, Don Heinemann, uh, as well as, um, I haven't seen the name. Don Wayne. Don Wayne. This foundation is the lifeblood of our club's longevity, okay? Without this, we don't get to do all the wonderful things that we do every year. Our overseas project, our bike night project, our teacher supply store, our other things we do in the community. 
I'm going to do what Dick just did. I'm going to give you the big ass. Get your checkbook out. Write some checks, okay? Uh, on that note, I'm going to get out and young come up. Oh, excuse me. I got one more. I'm sorry. Sorry about forgotten about Ryan. Real quick, tell us about. We've got lots of exciting parties going on. A very special event. You need to put your name down on it right now. It's turning up. Mr. Pickup Day on the 16th. <laughs> Bags will be furnished. Yeah, this is, this is a tradition that ever since I've been a club member 30 years, so it's something we always do. Please come out and help clean up Chapel Hill. Now I'm going to bring up Alan Young for what I'm looking forward to. It should be a great program. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Our speaker today is my friend, Libby Herman. We went to college together, but we didn't meet in college. We met some, I don't know, 15 years ago-ish at an improv class. Some of you, many of you will recall Greg Hahn, who spoke with us a few months ago, who teaches improv at Keenan Flagler. Well, about 15 years ago, I dabbled in improv for a couple of years, even though I mostly found it terrifying. You're up there on stage, you've got nothing. No scripts, nothing to fall back on. So in order to deal with this, I came up with a strategy. And my strategy was when I froze, I didn't know what to say, I would look around for the nearest laugh of an, another actor, and I would sit in their lap closest one and that always got a laugh well one night in class I froze and it was Mimi's first night there <laughs> and bless her heart I sat in her lap <laughs> and we've been friends ever since <laughs> serendipitous serendipitous Mimi is one of the most talented people I know she's a writer a teacher an editor an entrepreneur a chef, a gardener, and a very handy woman. Her new book, The Kudzu Queen, has been well received and won multiple awards. And rightly so. It's absolutely delightful, and so is she. Please welcome Mimi Herman. Yeah, we'll have to turn the other mic off. We'll do that. Yeah. If, you, if I try to talk with this in my hand, I talk with my hands, and it's going to go flying. Okay. <laughs> Can you all hear me in the back? Yeah. Excellent. Well, Alan has been telling me about you all forever, um, but he neglected to tell me the most important thing, how incredibly good looking you are. So, <laughs> Alan, you've been holding out on me. <laughs> Um, I am so delighted to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. Um, and so I'm going to talk with you a little bit. I'm going to read you a little bit. And um, I'm going to make you work. Is that all right? I know you're retired, so I'm going to bring you out of some of you. So I'm going to bring some of you out of retirement. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about me as a writer. Um, I started in fourth grade. I had this amazing fourth grade teacher. Anybody remember a great teacher you had? Yeah. That's my fourth grade, too. Fourth grade, right? Okay. And she taught me how to write poetry. Her name was Miss Stevens. Um, some of you may be old enough to remember the show Room 222. <laughs> you remember how pretty um, Karen Valentine was? That's exactly what Miss Stevens looked like. And she was just that nice. So she taught me how to write poetry. And I thought, wow, she's a genius. Because she taught me how to write poetry. What I didn't realize is that's part of the fourth grade curriculum and every fourth grade teacher teaches poetry. Because <laughs> she had been teaching nuclear physics, I'd be a nuclear physicist right now. So I have her to blame for the fact that I am not incredibly wealthy. Um, but she was a wonderful person and I wrote all through childhood. And then I wrote through a tortured adolescence. Am I the only one who had a tortured adolescence? No. Please tell me there were a few others. You're nodding and saying I'm the only one. Okay. No. Okay. So um, I wrote poetry all through high school. And then I came to UNC, and um, I had a huge crush on Doris Betts. Anybody remember Doris Betts? Yeah. yeah. Well, she only taught fiction. So if I was gonna study with Doris, which I really wanted to do, I had to learn how to write fiction. And that was the beginning of all this. Um, I 
many of you were lucky enough to study with her, that was a real hit. So I want to tell you a little bit about this book, The Kudzu Queen. This is my beaten up ratty copy that I take with me everywhere. Um, I started writing this book, let's see, is there anybody under the age of 30 in this room? <laughs> All right, well, go out of the room. Okay. Um, I started writing this book because I came across something on microfiche. Anybody remember microfiche? Yeah, okay, so try explaining that to a 20-something. You know, it's this big machine, and it's got lots of information in it. No, it's not a computer. Um, so I was rambling around on microfiche in the downtown Durham Public Library for some reason, who knows why, and I came across this article on Kutsu. And it told me that in the 30s and 40s, there were men who traveled the South promoting kudzu. Does anybody know this? Not so I read your bio. There you go, okay. <laughs> there were men who traveled the South promoting kudzu, and they would have these kudzu festivals and these kudzu queen beauty pageants. Um, and I thought, that's the strangest thing I ever heard. Because I we used to drive down from Raleigh to the beach when I was growing up, and we would drive through these tunnels of kudzu, right? Um, and I just thought, why would anybody intentionally plant this stuff? It's awful. But there were these men who did it, and not only that, but the government paid farmers to plant it. And they paid young men in the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, to plant it along railway embankments, which is why if you've ever taken a train in the south, you see all that kudzu? Okay, I was going to say it didn't just grow there. Well, it did, but it got started somehow through these, these uh, government programs. So I'd never heard of anything so strange. So I thought, I'll do what I always do when I can't figure something out. I'll write fiction to understand it. So I started writing about this guy, and he's kind of, um, you know, the music man, that, that musical, he's a little bit like that, um, but I think maybe darker. Um, and I had to have a narrator. And so one of the things that I do when I'm writing fiction is I take two things that seem to have nothing to do with each other. And I try to put them together, sometimes three. And I try to put them together to figure out why would these things be together. So I grew up in Chapel Hill, um, and I went to Carolina Friends School. Um, so we did all the arts, we did the dance, we did the theater, we did the music, and we wrote. Um, and I was kind of a precocious girl. And I have this idea there's a certain quality that 15-year-old girls sometimes have. I'm looking at the women in the audience here, I see if I'm right. 14, 15-year-old girls, who are kind of testing out their sexuality to see if they're attractive to, to grown-up men and to boys their age. Um, and sometimes it gets them in trouble, right? And so I wanted to figure out what would happen if I took kudzu, which takes over everything, and a 15-year-old girl and put them together. This is not a book that I wrote for 15 year old girls. This is a book I wrote for everyone. Because the other thing that I did was to create a fictional 101st county. Y'all know that North Carolina has 100 counties, right? So I knew that if I did a real county, someone would come up to me and they would say, well, the feed store was never over there. Or how come you made us look so bad? So I had to make up a new county. So I made up Cooper County. And I put Maggie Lee Watson in the middle of it. Well, actually, she's on the outskirts because her dad's a farmer. And um, she wants to be the kudzu queen. She wants to win this beauty pageant, despite the fact that she has no social graces whatsoever, something that I had in common with her, and we still have, even though Alan did sit on my lap. Um, and she wants the kudzu king, who is twice her age, to fall madly in love with her until she discovers his dark side. So I thought I'd read you a little bit so you can get to know a little bit of Maddie and a little bit of the cuts. This is from the early part of the book, so I don't give anything away in case you want to read it yourself. When the Kudzu King parked in front of the feed store and stepped out onto the running board, everything came to a stop. Mothers paused mid-sentence. Men's tobacco spits splattered silently in Pepsi-Cola bottles. Little girls froze in their reach for scattered jacks, and Danny's next pitch seemed to hang suspended in a long curve to home plate. The doors on the truck read Mr. James T. Cullowee, the Kudzu King, but you had only to look at him to know he was royalty. 
Imagine that, a man in a suit and tie, but it wasn't a Sunday wedding or funeral. And such a man, with golden hair like the Greek gods we'd studied in junior high. His suit was the forget-me-not blue of his eyes. His white shirt so bright, we had to squint to look at him. As for his tie, you couldn't tell if he'd chosen that green to match his truck or had the truck painted to go with his top. He vaulted over the side rail and stood astride a mountain of leafy, leafy cuttings. Ladies and gentlemen of Cooper County, my name is James T. Cullowy, and I've come to bring you the crop of the future. More versatile than cotton, more profitable than tobacco, more nutritious than corn, this crop will feed your family and livestock and fill your bank account with cold, hard cash. Boys abandoned their baseball game. Mother stepped out from the grocery doorway in small gatherings of curiosity, while girls, little and big, drew closer. Lynette and I hopped down from the school steps to stand at the back of the crowd. Kudzu, the wonder crop. He picked up a handful of vines and let them flow like a waterfall from his palm. It'll grow anywhere you plant it. No plowing, no fertilizer, no weeding. It needs barely a drop of water. Excellent forage for your horses, cattle, and mules, and a ground cover like you've never seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna borrow this chair down here for just a second. Go right ahead. Come Thank on you. Now. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, no. This is on me. I, I, I pack it, I carry it. All right, so, um, one of my principles in writing is called the three-legged stool. Okay, so let's try this. If I take this chair and stand it up on one leg, will it stand up? Yeah. See, now this is how I can tell you're not a nine-year-old boy because a nine-year-old boy would have said yes, and I'll say, can you make it? And he would have come and he would have tried, right? Okay. How about two legs? No. How about if it had three legs, like a three-legged stool? Okay. Same thing with writing. If you use just one of your senses in writing, like what you see, your writing's not going to come to life. If you use two, like what you see in here, it's a little stronger, but it's still not going to stand up. But if you use three, like see, hear, smell, or see, hear, smell, feel, or see, hear, smell, feel, taste, three, four, five, your writing stands up and it is a lot. So, the other thing that I like to do. <laughs> is I like to use my invisible imaginary writer's movie camera. And you will find one under your chair. Every one of you have an invisible writer's movie camera. Okay, so if you'll just pick it up and turn it on, put it on the desk, let it warm up. Okay, good job, okay. <laughs> so let me explain how that works, okay? Most movie cameras use only two senses. What do they use? Sight and hearing, right? Your movie camera has smell of vision right? With this movie camera, you can smell hot chocolate chip cookies baking in the oven. You can smell freshly mown grass, mowed grass. You can smell wet dog. That's not just good smells, it's bad smells. And this movie camera has a uh, touch of vision. You can feel snowflakes in Vermont falling on your eyelashes. You can feel yourself slogging through a foot and a half of snow up to the top of the hill and sliding down. And you can feel wet dog. And it has taste of vision. With this movie camera, you can taste German chocolate cake, fresh from the oven. Well, actually, no, let's have it iced now. It's not so good from the oven, right? You can taste um, my favorite food, a food so important that it should probably have its own food group, french fries. Yeah, right? Fresh from the fryer, greasy, salty, dipped in ketchup, or if you live in France, dipped in mayonnaise, and you can taste wet dog. Okay? And it also has great sea vision and sea vision and hero vision. Okay? And it has a really good zoom function. So, what we're going to do is we're going to use that movie camera, and you're going to help me with something. But before that, I want to tell you a little bit about um, my dad who was an amazing person. So when I uh, decided that I wanted to go to grad school, he gave me two presents. I wanted to get an MFA in creative writing. And he gave me two presents. One was Eudora Welty's book, One Writer's Beginnings, which I highly recommend. And one was that he paid for my graduate school. 
But when I started college, he gave me maybe the most important presence, present of my life. You know, um, any of you remember um, Joseph Campbell used to talk about follow your bliss? Okay, there's a whole generation of people who are following their bliss, all right? So my dad said, I want you to follow your bliss, and I want you to cover your ass. Okay? So you want to be a writer? Great. That's fantastic. Learn how to teach. So I have spent many, many, many years teaching, making that be the primary thing in my life. And it got to the point where I've been writing for years. This is not my first novel. This is my third novel. It's probably my sixth or seventh book. It's not the first book published, but it's the first novel published. But I became so passionate about teaching that I, I decided that, yes, that's one of my blisses too. But this was a really important bliss to me also. And so I'm going to guess you are all probably some of the most successful people in Chapel Hill. And you got there by following your bliss and covering your ass. Am I right? Okay. But I'm also going to guess that maybe there's a little bliss lurking in there that you haven't followed yet. So part of why I'm here is to act as inspiration. This book just got published in January. It just got two more recognitions this week. This is my bliss. And I followed it even when I was covering my ass more than I was following my bliss. <coughs> so, follow your bliss more. And now let's play with it. Okay. We're going to write about a memory. And I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you do this on your own. We're going to do it together, so that'll make it a lot easier. It's probably the darkest marker. So, um, I'm going to guess that Thanksgiving is not so far away that you don't remember it. Okay. I don't know. My memory's going, so maybe yours is too. So we're going to write about, about visiting your family for a big holiday dinner. And you're going to help me out. We're going to write what we remember. And it doesn't have to be this last Thanksgiving. It could be a Thanksgiving from 30, 40, 50 years ago. Okay? But I want you to close your eyes and imagine a family meal, maybe when you were a kid, like a big extended family meal. And think about um, what you smell as soon as you walk in the door of maybe your grandparents' house, okay? And when you've got one, tell me. And I'm gonna try to use my big teacher voice because I'm gonna go over here, but if you can't hear me, then we'll switch out microphones, okay? All right, can everybody in the back hear me all right? With my big teacher voice? Okay. So, what's one thing that you smell as soon as you walk in the door? Yes. Pumpkin pie. All right, make me drool. I want drool to come out of my mouth, land on the floor, fill up this room till we're swimming in a swimming pool of drool. What's so great about that's gross, right? But that's an image. It's warm. Oh, warm. What else? Tongue feel. Tastes good too. What what about the smell though? What do you smell? Mm. What was that? All spice cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, bourbon. <laughs> can you guys see that in the back? Can you read it? Okay. Okay. What else do we smell when we walk in that door? Turkey. Okay, maybe drool. Crackling, caramelized skin. Excuse me. All right. And I like how you used alliteration there too. Nice, same starting sounds. Caramelized. All right, give me one more smell when you walk in the door. Oh, uh, grandma's yeast rolls. Oh, maybe you Oh, they're brown. They're golden brown on top. They're soft. They're moist. The smell hits you when you open the door. They're big and fat. The drizzle <laughs> butter makes a glistening <laughs> shot. <laughs> Them some dang good rolls. I know. <laughs> are, you, are your feet getting wet down there with all that drool? <laughs> I live with a locker. I live with a locker. All right. Who comes out to greet you? The dog. The dog. <laughs> the dog. Okay, how does the dog greet you? Jumps on you. Tell me what that feels like when the dog jumps on you. Uh, so you feel the uh, the pressure of the front paws. You get that all the drool splashing around from the dog's mouth on you. I, I love it. Okay, oh, you win, so you get to tell me the dog's name. 
block. Shadow. Or, <laughs> the shadow does what with the front claws? Jump on my chest. But I'm short, and you lift your face. Right? <laughs> How about slathering me with yep. lovely kisses? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's truly a word, it is now, right? Oh, yeah. Julie. Okay, then what happens? Who else comes to greet you after Shadow? Oh, what's she like? Um, I don't know, maybe we should put her in reserve. She sounds awful. How about Grandma and Grandpa? What do they do? My well, grandma's busy cooking. She's oh, she's busy cooking. Okay. Are any grandpa hugs or anything? We are. We are. Uh-uh. Y'all are too young. We are. No. All right. Well, the cousins and all that. Okay. What are the cousins? All the kids. Do? Chaos. Noise. I like the cousin. Chaos everywhere. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's go into the kitchen and see what's cooking, shall we? I know you just ate, so you're not going to be quite as ready to drool as before, but I'm not just going to go into the kitchen. That's very boring. Um, by the way, I studied sign language at Carolina. I was the first person at Carolina to get them to accept sign language as a foreign language, which is kind of cheating because, you know, there's no written sign language. But um, I already knew Latin and French and Hebrew, and I wanted to know sign. So we don't want to be boring and say, I go into the kitchen, okay? And we don't want to pile on adjectives and adverbs, okay? Think of nouns and verbs as being like a backpacker, and adjectives and adverbs as being the stuff they carry in their backpack. So what, if I were to say, I went really very extremely quickly into the kitchen, would that sound fast? No. What's a better way? Can we do it all in one word? Race. Race. I raced into the kitchen. Or I raced into the kitchen. More likely you pick your way carefully around kids' toys and scattering. See, that, that's a grandpa talking. That's not a kid. <laughs> All right. I race into the kitchen for what? Make me drool again. Popcorn. Wine. <laughs> okay. We have to take a brief moment out for me to tell, tell you that Alan and I have been in a group for years. Um, we call it OGOG. We are very uh, modest. OGOG sounds, stands for our group of geniuses. And we would get together once a month and we would help each other figure out what we want to do next and how to make it happen. So, on this, Alan always brought popcorn. Okay, make me drool again. I mean, I know what your popcorn tastes like. But... Um, salty, uh, fluffy. Heavenly. <laughs> heavenly. I don't know what heavenly tastes like. No? Yeah, like my friend. Well, you ain't had any souls then. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, you're yeah, right. right. <laughs> How about uh, salty, fluffy popcorn fresh from Alan Popper? There you go. Okay. All right. What else are we going to eat? Gone pot. Make me drool. It, it, it's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's, 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 it's so good, it reminds me of Jim Rowell's first kiss with his girlfriend. <laughs> ah, wow, okay. <laughs> so good. I'll get you, I'll get you. <laughs> Reminds me of Jim Robles' first kiss. R O B L E S? Robles, yes. Where is Phil? And her name was Minnie. Yeah. Her name was Minnie. No, true, true story. No. Yeah. yeah. Right, now you're just kissing up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So think back. What did the parents and grandparents talk about that the kids weren't supposed to be listening to? Mm -hmm. 
perhaps Uncle George got drunk the other week and fell in the tub. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Did he break anything? Just his pride. <laughs> Oh, and you did tear down the shadow curtain. <laughs> <laughs> the rod is moving. <laughs> no, it's the curtain ripped off. <laughs> like you know, changing the name of the Texas show for you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, my, it's my, yeah. my, my grandmother's brother. True story. <laughs> Texas, of course, said. <laughs> The Steakhouse. Oh, that's a story for a different day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Meanwhile, we kids are doing what? Where are we? Meanwhile. Where do the kids go? Basement. Ooh. You get some serious trouble in the basement, right? What are we doing in the basement? Stealing liquor. <laughs> Oops. What do we do? Some kind of liquor? What happens over here? What are we doing? Uh, stealing. <laughs> stealing liquor from who? Who's liquor? From the liquor cabin up there. Uh, well, I don't know. Those grown ups are still up there, so how are we going to. We got away with it. Ah. Let's, let's be a, I like it. I like it, but we don't want to have everybody think that it's a whole family full of drums. Okay? That's just my family. That's just his family. <laughs> what else would we be doing? They're playing football. Watching football. Yeah, watching football. Okay. They're not in the basement. Not in the basement. Should we go outside somewhere? Yeah. All right. Where are we instead of outside? Yeah. They're playing the turkey ball. Yeah. Yeah. With the older children playing the younger children. In a very competitive atmosphere. Okay, um, I, if I was that age, I probably would have said older children and younger children. I would have said big kids versus little kids. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And there's an old person that's a commissioner. Really? <laughs> Who's the old person? His grandpa? Older than grandpa or older than 18. Yeah, a grandpa with a cane. Grandpa what? With a cane. Who walked with an aid of a cane. Is this going to be a horror story? Yeah. And carry the switch. All right. Until what happens? What tells us we have to come back inside? Until the four year old start crying because they won't let him score. <laughs> Well, so does he have to come inside. One of the moms saw us out. Who's ready to call your dad? Who's ready? Time to eat. Time to eat. Yeah. Time to eat. That's because the dog ran off with the ball. Oh my gosh. All right. It's a whole comedy. It's a whole comedy. It's a whole comedy. It's a whole comedy. It's a whole So we can move down to the end. All right. Y'all just wrote a poem. How many of you wake up every morning and you go, wow, golly gee deepers, maybe if it's a really good day, I'll get to write a poem today? <laughs> You're nice. And how many of you would rather do your taxes? Or, okay, maybe not do your taxes. One person with bath cereal. How about throw the bathtub? How about do something really lame like go out to dinner with a friend? Yeah, okay, you just did it. So let's read this together. I'm going to say one, two, ready, go. You're going to read it. When you read it, you read a little slowly, a little more slowly than you would normally speak. You pause at each line and you read it like you mean it. Okay, here we go. One, two, ready, go. The, the warm, warm spice of pumpkin pie, crackling caramelized turkey, grandma's buttery brown yeast rolls, shadow jumps on my chest, Slathering me with drooly kisses, 
causing chaos everywhere. I race into the kitchen for salty, fluffy popcorn, fresh from Alice Popper. Pecan pie so good, it reminds me of Jim Rogel's first kiss with his girlfriend, Minnie. The grown-ups talk about how Uncle George got drunk last week and fell into the tub. True story. Didn't break nothing about his pride. Meanwhile, we kids are out in the backyard playing the turkey bowl. Big kids versus little kids, with Grandpa with his cane as commissioner, until the four-year-old starts crying because we won't let him soar, and Mom calls out, it's time to eat before the dog runs off with the turkey. Give yourself a round of applause. All right, can we see things in that writing? Yeah. Do we smell things in that writing? Yeah. Do we taste things? Yeah. Hear things? Feel things? Do you all use your invisible writers to movie camera? Yeah. All right. You're all writers. Yeah. Yes. Certified <laughs> writers. Okay, so now what I want you to think about, I want you to close your eyes one more time, and I want you to think about that little bit of bliss you haven't followed yet, because y'all are young yet. And I want you to think about that bliss, and I want you to think about that first step you're going to take following your bliss. All right, would you turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what you just thought of? Go ahead. Because when you tell somebody, I promise I'll answer anything you ask me. I don't promise I'll answer it honestly. Yeah. <laughs> anything you want to know? If you don't ask questions, it's going to be a very short Q&A session. <laughs> so, in your, in your book, The Cubs You Clean, um, the salesman um, said there, I'm assuming that there really were Salesman who, who did this? Yeah, and, uh, there were. So there was this one man named Channing Cope um, who wrote for the Atlanta Constitution before it became the Journal Constitution. And he had a radio show that he ran off his front porch. And he had something called the Kudzu Club of America with over a thousand members. So he thought the Kudzu was going to be the savior of the South. I mean, he really did think it was going to be the king. Because think about it here's a plant that grows literally a foot in 24 hours. You know, so think about the time too. It's right after the depression, it's right after the dust bowl. Farmers are looking for something that will feed their family and their their, their animals, and we're looking for something that's going to prevent erosion. It really looked like the miracle crop. I mean, the government was behind it. The government's not always so wise, but yes. Now follow that up. So what's worse, bamboo or kudzu? Well, you know, okay. Here's the deal. Neither of them is worse in its own right, but we are famous in this country for bringing over things to solve problems and not bringing over the rest of the food chain. Um, and both bamboo and kudzu come from Japan and China, where they have natural enemies and they're highly valued. They are very practical plants, but they're kept in check. So for me, I have to say kudzu, but I don't want near. I don't have any bamboo in my yard. Yeah, for you, it's bamboo. 
How did you guess that? Have, have, have you, okay. Have you ever used uh, goats or herd of goats to yeah, control goats. kudzu? Yeah, yeah. Goats will take it out for a while, but the, the root is just, I mean, it's like my arm. It's just this thick tuber. And if you don't get the roots out, it's going to come back. But goats are great. Uh -huh. um, two and then three. How did you find your publisher and your agent? My wife is that likes children's stories. And she, of course, is looking. She has them on Amazon and all that. But it's a, they, she make it, she, Amazon makes some money. She gets poor. How do you, how do you get published? Um, so I actually sent this directly to the publisher. I did not go through an agent. And the publisher fell madly in love with the book and decided that she wanted to publish it. I thought she was going to tear it to shreds, and she didn't. So I went back and did a lot of major editing before it became before it was published. Did you have a professional editor look at your book before you submitted it? I happen to live with one. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. Uh, um, and he's, okay. he's a kick-ass editor. Okay, cool. Yeah. So there's there's one story where he, um, the second time he edited the book, he came to me in my office and he said, I have something to tell you and you're not going to like it. I said, okay. And he said, you know that 40 pages, the entire end of your book that you labored over for months to get exactly right? And I said, yes. He said, it's got to go. Right. And I did this. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. And I took it out, and I've never regretted it. He said, if your climax happens here, that's all anticlimactic instead of more your reader to tears. Yes. Tell us about your second book of poetry. Oh, Field Guide to Human Emotions? Yeah. Okay, great. So I write fiction to find out what's going to happen next. Like, I don't plot my books. I find my way through them. But I write poetry to figure out how the world works. And um, having been a very emotional teenager, as I confess, um, I'm fascinated with emotions. So Field Guide to Human Emotions is um, emotions personified. Um, so, you know, you've got envy, and you've got, um, oh gosh, I can't remember all of them. But they're all kind of smart alecky emotions. Um, and it's what I think they would be like if they were people. You know, if you had a person that was just entirely that emotion. And a few of them are not exactly personified, but they're what we call an extended metaphor, where you take one metaphor and you kind of stretch it out like, like bubble gum. So it's a fun book. Um, I, originally, I called it a Reader's Digest Guide to Human Emotions because my Bible is a Reader's Digest manual guide to human to, to homework care. So I live in a house that's about to turn 100, and I've been, you know, teaching myself carpentry and plumbing and electrical stuff for years since I bought the house. And so that was my Bible. Um, but then at the very last minute after it was accepted, I thought, you know, maybe I should check with Reader's Digest and see how they feel about this. <laughs> they didn't like the idea. So it's a field guide to human emotions. One, two, three. Can you tell us a little about your process? Did it take you three years to think about the idea, to get the inspiration in the long weekend to write it? Um, <laughs> I love you. I'm going to live that life. That's like a fantasy life to me. Um, so I started this, as I said, um, after I saw this thing on microfiche, I was at this wonderful place um, in uh, Southern Pines um, called Weymouth, where writers go to, to just write. Um, and I like a flood of this stuff came out. And a lot of the stuff that I wrote on yellow legal pads um, is still in the is it still in the book. And I started this in 1994. So my way to write is to just write as much as I can until I have lots of pages. The original draft when I thought the book was finished was 680 pages. Even my own mother would not have read the book. So I did what I call play pickup sticks. Can I pull out this phrase, this chapter, this character, this subplot, um, until I had it down to a more normal 320 pages. So I keep writing to figure out what's happening. And normally when I'm writing well, I lose track of time and of the world, and it's like I'm in that movie. And all I'm doing is running around behind the characters trying to keep up with what they're doing and writing down. All right, I had two more. Yes. Or sorry, one, two. Yes. So, when you finish your high, so what is your next list? My next list. Well, um, gosh, my real bliss would be building a house from the ground up, but I'm not sure I'm going to live long enough for that. So, how about the, the novel that I'm writing right now that's set in Ireland in the mid 80s um, with uh, the grandchild of an IRA 
think Mahima, who was missing, um, and uh, a drag queen named Holly Unlikely. <laughs> okay. Yes. So I once heard D.G. Martin on a stage with John Hart and John Grisham. Wow. And it was a wonderful event for all. And but the interesting thing was, I think John Grisham said he knew exactly what was going to happen in the book before he ever wrote the first word. And John Hart said he had no idea what was going to happen until he started writing in there. Now, where are you on that? That's a great question. I divide the world up into planners and wingers. And a planner knows what she's going to wear tomorrow before she goes to bed tonight. I'm going to get to your planner. No, you're a winger? I love it. People so planned. Um, and the, the motto of a winger is, how can I know what I mean until I see what I say? So I'm a winger up until I get to a certain point, and then I do some planning, and then I go back to winging. Um, the novel I'm writing now, I actually know more about it, I've planned more about it than I ever have, which may be what's slowing me down, because it's not such an adventure to write to see what's going to happen. So I'd say I'm more of a winger. Yeah. When you write something, obviously, that appears in 94, so for I think I hold it a long time. So when you write something, how long do you leave it before you go back to it? And then when you go back to it, you say, I can't believe I actually wrote that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I will say in that time, I taught 25,000 people. I wrote three other books, you know. I did, and I started a business um, with writing workshops in France, Italy, and Ireland. And, uh, France, Italy, Ireland, and New Mexico. So it's not like I was, you know, flying around the house. Well, you, you were a slacker, though. I was a slacker, yeah, what should I say? And I renovated the house. But um, I just leave it and come back to it when it calls to me. Um, but this kept calling me, so this one I left for a number of years and then finally came back to it. One yeah. more question. Good. The, um, I, I love alliteration, and I'm reminded of an ad in the News Observer years ago <coughs> that said, Reindeer remnant removed from roofs of Raleigh residents, call Richardson Roof. That's brilliant. I love it. That's good. That's a great note to end on. Thank you all so much. This has been such a